believe it, is that Zero was so damn talented and so intelligent that he bored easily. So, uh, in a funny thing, when he told the story about threading anachronism into the show, it was particularly exasperating for all of us because there were no anachronisms in the show. It was always right on uh, the uh, Plotus message. Uh, so it didn't make any room for Cadillacs or uh, any odd names or mentions that don't belong right in the period. Uh, when it came to uh, Fiddler, he got uh, bored uh, doing the same thing night after night. He was a consummate personality, a great, a really wonderful actor. And we'll talk more about that because I think I'm quite responsible for his being in that show. <laughs> Here we have <laughs> Washington Post 
was Mr. Abbott, colon, close it. <laughs> now the, the wonder of all this is not only the story about getting Jerry to come, but it, it's really important to know that they played in the National Theater never to more than three or four rows of audience. <coughs> And they never got a snicker during the entire show. And honestly, Zero and every Jack and everybody else played it as if they were getting laughs from the audience. And I thought that was about as professional and extraordinary as any experience I had. Now, my part of that was I was peppy. I think that's an old-fashioned word. But I, I just... <laughs> I was a cheerleader, and there, it was pretty glum around there. And my job was to say, this is going to be a smash on Broadway. Now, what people don't know is, in the old days when you did a musical, you'd have a, a performance for uh, the actors on Broadway. Saw scenery, no costume, because there wasn't any. But you'd do it before you went on the road. We had that performance, and they went nuts. So I lived on the memory of what had happened in New York. So what happened in Philly, and what happened in Washington, I kept saying, it's going to be fine in New York. Meantime, uh, Sondheim wanted Jerry, and they all did, to, to uh, initiate an opening number, which became comedy tonight. To answer your question, I went into the dressing room, and the rest is right. I said, I will not ask Jerry to come here. I won't do it. If you had said no, you would have said no. I knew, once. yes. Wow. I knew the whole history. Wow. Uh, I knew the whole history because uh, my wife knew Zero long before, and Katie, and the whole gang, and Ray, and, and Phil, all of them. And they were in California. And, and uh, so uh, the first I ever saw her, she was in California. Uh, the point is, she knew all about all their problems and what they'd gone through. And so I, in knowing her, and before we were married, I knew a lot about a history that I had never known before. So of course I said, I won't call him. And that's when he, not even didn't take a pause, said, you, you haven't asked me to have lunch with him. And I said, no. And he said, then, send for him. And he was in California getting the Academy Award that night. And I called him, and he got on a plane the next morning and flew straight to Washington. Wasn't he supposed to be the original director? I don't. Don't remember, don't think so, don't. I really don't know. I know that uh, Abbott, uh, because I was friendly with Sondheim again, I, I was the connection to Abbott. So I don't know who, who had rejected it earlier. But uh, it's worth saying what you say about that script. The script was sensational, but it needed that opening. Nothing. Really, there were very few rewrites. That wasn't the problem. Restaging, sure. Doors, people missing, all kinds of stuff. Jerry is very good at that. But it really was largely about an opening number because it was cast brilliantly. Was it like instantaneous the night that that number went in that everything really bang changed? Well, it didn't go until New York when we got back. So we didn't have a, we didn't have a happy time until we got back to Broadway. But I've always thought, and I'm sure there'd be disagreement on this from the, uh, from the authors, uh, only one of whom is still alive. Uh, I've always thought it got that response originally. It would get that response when we got it. never was an international success. It was hugely successful in London with a guy named Frankie Howard. But it was not a huge success on the road. It was not a huge success internationally. Uh, it gets done a lot now. But 
not originally. So, uh, you know, I think it was a, a Broadway show. The, uh, the, I took two liberties, thanks to my director, because um, the, when, when Jerry Robbins did come in, Zero did say higher loose lips, didn't he? Well, I, I, my memory's not that good. I don't, oh, good. I'll say two things. Uh, sure. <laughs> but I don't remember that. But I'll tell you what I do remember. And it's very much in character with the Zero that I knew. And you play. Zero made a deal to behave. And he behaved all the time when Jerry was there. But the minute Jerry was out of sight, he had a lot of stuff to say to the rest of the cast and all of us. So he got it out that way. Uh -huh. the, the other one was I read in Louis Botto's, uh, he did an article in Playbill that Zero had this minor nervous breakdown, the opening of, of Fiddler on the Roof, and that he was in the, the street and that Robbins pulled him back into the theater. So I took it on a flight of fancy of what caused that. Well, do you know any, any information? No, that's his best. Well, Zero was story. going to Dr. Feelgood. Oh. <laughs> then I should have been faster. <laughs> I should have been faster. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was. There were a lot of people going to Dr. Feelgood, including John Kennedy. Right. Uh, but he was going. And I do recall saying to him, this this is not going to continue. It's not. You're you're gonna crack at some point, and he did. I don't know that it was as close to the opening, but it was at some point, and then he he was fine. Yeah. But uh, it's it certainly was a bad idea. There is a uh, video up at uh, the Lincoln Center Library of Zero doing Fiddler, <laughs> and I guess it was in the seventies. It was that. And when I was doing research for this show, I asked to see it. And the Robbins estate had forbidden anyone to see it because Zero had misbehaved. So Jerry was dead, and they gave us permission to go see it. We were the fifth and sixth people ever to see it. Ever to see it. And Zero does the milk bit. Oh, yeah. oh. And that's exactly why Jerry forbid anybody well, to see it. Well, that, that was the beginning of the end. Uh, there's a, another story you might be interested in. Uh, I thought it was time for Zero. I was very instrumental in Zero playing that part, actually. Uh, Milton Berle absolutely was the first choice. I don't remember that Phil was even in the running. I do know that Red Button's name was mentioned. But I thought, uh, this is and, and Fiddler, I thought Zero. I've had a terrific experience before, and I thought he's a great actor. And, such a larger than life a personality. So I really, I think I was quite instrumental in talking them into it when Uncle Milty went away. Uncle Milty kept making more and more uh, uh, he, He's, by the way, an adorable man, Milton Berle, but uh, something to handle. I, I, walk, <laughs> I, I walked into my office one day and he was sitting in it with his feet up on the desk on the phone. And I thought, I think this has got to stop, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and, and so really, I, I thought, I was sort of pushed him aside and said, we, we have to have Zero. Well, at the end of that almost year that Zero played, uh, I thought we should replace him. And the Schubert's were very upset. Because they said, you've got the goose that laid the golden eggs. Why don't you renegotiate with them? And finally, with sheer pressure, I agreed to go to his lawyer's office, Sidney Cohn, who was a, a friend and of all those people you've been talking about. And we sat down and we knocked out a, a contract much against my will. Not that I didn't love what Zero did, but I didn't think he'd continue to do it. Uh, uh, I didn't think he'd be patient. So, but, but I caved. So we negotiated the contract, 
And uh, I started to walk out. <coughs> it was done. And Sidney Cohn said, oh, by the way, Hal, small matter. Forgot to tell you, Zero needs a car and chauffeur to and from the theater. And I turned and I said, I take the deal off the table. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And I walked out. So, uh, because salary we were paying, he could pay his way to and from the theater. And the point is, I then cast a Luther Adler. The, the effort was to take it away from being the Zero Mostel show. Because some days Zero Mostel will leave it. And it was still going so strong. But there's this eminent Yiddish theater star who'd been a star on Broadway who would play it not remotely like Zero. And that's exactly what happened. And suddenly it became finally fitted on the roof. Um, it's sort of legend, I mean, the fact that Zero misbehaved while on stage, while on its own California on tour, and he was misbehaving too. The question, though, and maybe you answered it a bit, uh, talking about how you behaved when Jerry Robin was around. What was Zero like in, re in the rehearsal process? Um, disciplined. He was disciplined. totally disciplined. An artist. He respects artists. He didn't respect anybody who wasn't talented, but he, he did respect them. There's another thing you do on the show that I so, was so grateful for. I'm not going to repeat it because it's catalogical, but the joke uh, with Katie uh, to Zero, to zero uh, is quintessential Katie and Zero, and they had a... Oh, oh yes, 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 yes. I'm not going to repeat it. I, uh, <laughs> I will. He will. <laughs> Something about stabbing, right? I, I, I said, I'll stab you in the ball. Yes, <laughs> right. Anyway, the point is, it was quintessential, and they had the most calamitous and wondrous marriage, but it was stormy as hell. <laughs> yeah. Well, I when we opened the show in Toronto, the producer said to me, we uh, have 30 of Zero's paintings up here, and we're going to have Josh Mostel open it with you. Now, I, I, I had sent Josh the script. He read it. And he said, uh, it's historically accurate, except you spelled Plautus wrong. <laughs> uh, that was Josh's only take. So, so he came up to Toronto, and they said, we have four TV interviews set for the two of you. So I got into the car, and he was in two-thirds of the back seat of the car. And he put his hand out, and he said, I'm not seeing the show tonight. And I said, I, I got you. I understand. He said, I didn't like my parents. He said, I don't want to spend any more time with them. <laughs> True. So we had these four interviews, oh boy. and we had this long lunch where he really let go, and at the end of the lunch he said, I'm seeing the show tonight. <laughs> and he came, and he was the first one on his feet, and he brought me aside afterwards. He said, I never thought I'd see my father again. Oh. It was really very, very touching to me. And then he what came up to Did you see Toby? No, Toby's kind of living this uh, here. Yeah, he did. He's in Florida. And uh, he's a painter, but uh, it, Josh doesn't speak to him. He said, I hate my whole family. I don't talk to my brother. I don't talk to anybody. And he's up in Monhegan now. I totally get why a, 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 a progeny might hate his father. Uh, uh, certainly, if his father is zero. Because he, he was a handful. What he said was that his mother and his father were a self-contained unit and there was no room for anybody else. Well, and he felt really excited. He knew it better than I did. Because I would, I would tend to have adored Katie. I thought she was just, I don't know, it was rough what she had to go through. Really yeah. a rough deal. So I, I did not feel that in their relationship at all. I thought it was very confrontational. Uh, you're hard at work now on the Prince of Broadway, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, were, you were early this morning and you shot out here to be with us. So we're so grateful for that. So um, I guess the question is, how, how will, how will uh, Fiddler and uh, Forum be represented? Can you share a little well, of that? So I didn't tell you to ask me this, did I? No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I... Because it's the only thing I want. 
I've often said you were my mentor, and I think I just got it. <laughs> but he's going to say something nice and quiet. No, I think it would be very interesting. Uh, if I were a rich man, is being sung by the great August Wilson actor Chuck Cooper. Oh, really? And I've been rehearsing in the last two days, and it's thrilling. But it's the point you make. It, it worked in Japan. All right. It worked all over the world. Right. And this man will come out on stage, an African-American giant of a, of yeah. a creature. He has that uh, in common with Zero. And that makes me so happy. His, <laughs> what? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, just one, one or two questions. I held, 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 is exhausted once again. Home, he said, "I'm a real, real long day." He's exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> He's exhausted. I emailed Jim and I said, "Jim, I emailed Jim and I said, Jim, I Jim, and I said, Jim look, is there anything that you want me to bring up that I can lead the conversation to you and Hal?" And he said, "How about you? How about you go up on stage and do the show, and I sit back there with Hal?" <laughs> Anyway, maybe uh, one quick, yes, yes. I hate for this to end here, it was so good. Any plans for it to be brought up with? No, uh, no. This, I, I hadn't done the show in about four years, and I thought I had hung up my zero shoes. Use your mic. Oh, and I thought I hung up my uh, zero shoes, and then uh, the people at the Piccadillo said, this is available, do you want to do it? And I thought, okay, I'm, let's see if I can do it. And I love doing it. I just am so happy. I hope it's not the end. I really hope it's not the end. I hope some wonderful producer will take it to Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> some legendary producer who might have seen it. <laughs> Can I ask you a quick question? Has it been recorded for the library in Lincoln Sands? Yes. Good. Yes, it has. Yes. Um, I'm Ivan Black Jr. Oh. Use your mic, please. From worst of all, what I understand, he was in tremendous pain the whole time. That leg always gave him. You know how I always thought about it. this leg and him doing two performances of Fiddler on a Wednesday and two on a Saturday. You know, I saw him backstage after Forum one night. Howard, there was a wonderful dresser he had. Howard, I can't think, of it, but he had a blue terry cloth bathrobe on, and I saw the leg, which looked like fire. It looked like it graphs, you know, and he had a, a, an adhesive bandage. And I kept thinking, how could this man spend six hours? He never complained. He, he did. did never complain. He never called attention to it in all the years that I worked on. Never. But to answer your question, he didn't like the producers. He and Mel Brooks didn't get along. It was Mel's first film, and he was funfering his way through it, and he just didn't like the result either. So, yeah. Okay, well... I think, I think we're going to wrap it up for today, but I, I just want to, oh, okay, just one more. Thank you. <laughs> Was I all right? Yeah, you know, I never saw you in the jewelry. Nobody did. <laughs> one, there's another trooper up there. Oh, hello. Yeah, Joe Campanero and Anna Campanero. We did six characters in search of an author. Oh, no, that's true. We're still searching. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Yes, we're trying to get there.